All right, well, good morning again. For those of you that may have just walked in or just joined us, my name is Rick. Rick Flynn, I'm the campus pastor here. It's great to see you all. If you're a guest, I'm, I'm glad to see you too. It's great to see you. I'm excited that uh, you are here today. Um, we'll just, just jump right in. Have you ever had one of those moments where, I don't know, you, you were reminded of something that maybe you learned a long time ago that for, for whatever reason you got busy or, or you started learning new stuff that you kind of forgot you knew that you knew that? All right? Have you ever had that moment? I ha- that happens to me almost every Sunday in here. I knew I knew your name, but I couldn't remember it, so I just kind of went, hey, buddy. You know what I mean? You get one of those, right? There's things that you learn, and you just you kind of forget them, and you had that moment where this, these things are kind of you know, important to you, and you can't really draw them up. And there's this phenomenon in, in our lives that this happens. It happens to me a lot, and, and Kathy, she's actually volunteering in the kids' space today, my wife. She would remind you all the time of the things that I forget that I know I know, right? Like how to do the dishes or take out the trash, right? Those things happen. Uh, in other words, I forget how to love her, right? Ooh, that, I'm trying to get some brownie points. My anniversary is coming up, so I'm trying to work this in here. But I do know that, that one of her love languages is acts of service, right? But sometimes I forget that, and it's, it's, it's hard for us to, you know, it's one thing to have a knowledge of something and know that. It's another thing for us to actually remember it and apply it to our lives, to actually make it a part of us. So believe it or not, there is in the English language a word for this, and that word is a word for internalizing and applying this knowledge, right? So if I don't internalize the things that I learn, especially sometimes there's teachers in here, I don't see very many, so, uh, Miss Wilson there. If I don't internalize what I learned, right, trigonometry, I'm never going to use that again, but anyway, whatever, if I, don't internal, <laughs> if I don't internalize this stuff and apply it to my lives, right, it doesn't really work out. But this phenomenon or this word in the English language for this is called wisdom. Raise your hand if you got wisdom. I'm just kidding, right? <laughs> wisdom is applied knowledge. It's when we take what we know and it becomes a part of us right? It influences us. It, it, it informs our decisions. It's, it's just in our DNA. It acts underneath the surface kind of subconsciously. It's just there guiding us without us being aware of it. It flows in us and flows out of us, right? Here's that Star Wars rep, right? right? The force, right? Oh my gosh. Scratch that joke. None of these jokes are working today. I know if I'm off or what, but there are these references to, to the things that we know and understand and if we have internalized it, it becomes part of our everyday thing, right? And we, we start to use it. There's this quote that kind of sums it up. Knowledge is knowing what to say. Wisdom is, when, is knowing when to say it, right? I've heard it another way. Knowledge is, is knowing what to say, and, and, and wisdom is knowing when to shut up, right? <laughs> yeah, I do that a lot with my wife. Just stop talking. It gets a lot better if you do that. So our faith kind of operates in this way. Uh, many of us, whether we're Jesus followers or not, we know the stories of Jesus. We've heard them our whole lives, right? We know about Jesus walking on water. We know about uh, him, you know, the miracles and things. We know about him healing the blind and calming the storm and all of these things. We know these stories. We've heard them, him feeding the 5,000. These are amazing, really cool things to learn about, and we've read about them, right? We've heard of Jesus, and even some of us have seen miracles in our own lives. And we just, things that, you may not call it a miracle, but you just can't explain, there's no way that was possible, right? No way. So it's one thing to have knowledge of these stories, especially about Jesus and the things that he did. And then it's another thing to actually believe them, to buy into them to the point that they guide everything about our lives. If we really, truly believe in Jesus and we really, truly want to follow him, then some of the stuff that, his, that he says, right, if not all of the stuff that he says and does, we are going to start to believe in and we're going to start to try to be like Jesus to the point that it influences our lives where we're willing to say, God, I believe a miracle is possible. God, I believe that healings can happen and I believe that this is not the end. God, I believe you are here, and I believe that life wins, right? Jesus overcome death. Life wins no matter what. We have the opportunity for an eternal life after this life. 
We have to believe these things. So today we're starting this new series, What If? What If? And we're asking, what if I believed the promise of God? Let that sink in a minute. What if I believed the promise of God? How would it change us? How would it change my life? How would it change our lives? How would us believing in God and the things that he teaches and the way that he tells us to live, how would that change our world? And we want to move from just a knowing and a knowledge of the story of who he is and where he came from, but we want to internalize it to make it part of us. That it's, and we want to internalize what's in, contained in the scriptures and internalize it and put it in us, make it part of who we are. The story that I'm going to read you today is, is about the, the disciples and how they struggled with this very same thing, the same thing that we struggle with, I think. Now, these guys, they were around Jesus. They followed him around, and they saw the things that he did. They saw the miracles. They saw the, deaf, or the blind man see again, right? They saw him heal the deaf. They saw him feed the 5,000. They were there when it happened. But they still struggled to apply Jesus' teachings to their life. So let me read this to you. It's Matthew 17, 14 through 20. And we kind of see how this plays out in their lives. So and when they came to, to the crowd, and a man came up to him, and kneeling before him, he said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls, falls into the, to the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. Heal him. And Jesus answered, this is where he gets a little frustrated. Jesus says, oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, hey, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, because of your little faith. For truly, I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. That's a pretty bold statement right there, right? How many of you have looked at a mountain and went, ah, moved, right? Tried to move it. You see, here we have this man who is desperate for help. He's been with this son for years, and, and he has these seizures, right? And he falls into fires, and he falls into, you know, the water. And this man has got to be hurting on the inside, right? The, you know, how many of us have suffered some kind of experience like this where a loved one is hurting or something's going on with them, and we don't want them to suffer? We would rather that, you know, we take that away. We would do anything to take their pain away, to take away whatever it is that they're suffering with and, and bring it on ourselves, make it our own. And here's this father watching his son who has these seizures and he falls into fires, falls into the water, and he has to be there with him. And he's got to wonder, you know, all the time, you know, what happens if I'm not around? This is a crazy heavy burden for this man to carry. His family. I mean, think about how many of you have been caretakers of loved ones and you kind of understand how hard this can be in your life. This man is in this place of desperation, and he's willing to do whatever it takes so that his son will be healed. I mean, think about it. He goes to the disciples, and they don't heal him. The disciples of Jesus, and they can't heal the man. We talk a lot about being a disciple of Jesus, right? Now, we weren't walking around 2,000 years ago with Jesus, but if, if we profess to be a believer in Christ, if we say that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and we believe that for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, right? If we believe that, we are disciples. We are apprentices. When's the last time you healed somebody, right? When's the last time you walked on water? You see, Jesus learns about this this man and his son, and he learns that the disciples were unable to, to help him. 
So rather than, than get into a lot of details, he heals the boy in the moment. But I, I, I think right before that, Jesus has this moment of, of, of uh, divine frustration. And he cries out, oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? Now, in our culture, we try not to generalize everybody, right? But I mean, we do, but we try not to. We say it's bad, but we do it anyway. But Jesus is actually doing that here, right? He's generalizing all of them, not just the disciples. He's talking about all people. How long am I going to have to be here for you guys? You're not getting it. I came to show you who God is. I came to tell you and teach you who I am and where I came from, but you aren't getting it. That frustration has got to be there for years, or for, for a reason, right? That mission of, of bringing people to, to God, to teaching them who Jesus is and telling them. Like we have a mission, right? Our mission is to lead people to an act of faith in Jesus. Think about that. How many times have we missed opportunities to actually do that? And how frustrating that can be for God and Jesus as he looks at us like, what else do I got to do? I died for you. Jesus' mission on earth is to teach people by showing them who God is. And this message is not sinking in. They're not getting it at all. So moments before this story, this is what's crazy. If you, you know, you can't just take a scripture, and a lot of times we will preach on scriptures, but I want you guys to read the Bible. A lot of times when they call it exegesis, and I, I call that like extra Jesus. You're looking for the extra Jesus in scripture, but you got to, to read the whole thing, right? Read the, the part before and the part after it to get the full context of what's going on. Well, before this encounter, they have a moment on the, on the mountaintop with Jesus, and this is a literal mountaintop. We have highs and lows in our lives, and we, like youth group, we come back from youth trips, and that's a mountaintop experience. They're fired up. We're going to go home. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. I got kids coming to me on second Tuesday. They said, man, we're ready for youth group. We went to the, to the mission trip, and that, that's their mountaintop. They're fired up. They're ready to go, right? Well, Jesus and the disciples, they have their actual literal mountaintop experience where Jesus appears to change physically. They call it the transfiguration. And Scripture tells us that Jesus' face sh shined like the sun, and he, he appeared to be light itself. He changes, and the voice of God speaks to them, and he says, this is my son. The disciples are there. They not only see Jesus turn into you know, light itself, but they hear the voice of God tell them, this is my son. So the disciples, they know who they're dealing with. They understand who, who this man is. They were there. Now, I'm going to let us off the hook just a tiny, tiny bit, right? We, we weren't there. We didn't see this, but we have Scripture, right? We've been reading about it, and we study it, and we learn it. But do we believe it? Do we believe what he's telling us? So after this experience, Jesus begins to, to, pre to prepare the disciples, and he tells them, you know, preparing them to let them know, foreshadowing that, hey, I'm not always going to be here. Right? We, we have the benefit. We, 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 we already flipped to the end. We know what happens. These guys don't. Right? right up until the Last Supper, they still don't get it that he's not going to be there. So you can understand this, this frustration that Jesus is having. You guys got to get this. You got to know. You got to understand. You could see why Jesus has this. And his disciples actually saw Jesus as the Son of God. They affirmed it. They knew that he was sent by God into the world. And yet... Their faith, when their faith was put to the test, they couldn't do it. They failed. They couldn't see things the way Jesus was trying to teach them. They saw Jesus as the Son of God and as the one sent by God, but, but when they attempted to, to put their faith into practice, they failed. And that's the purpose of this series, What If? What if it's possible to be with Jesus to know Jesus because we know the stories and we have witnessed miracles ourselves, right? And I know it's hard to apply all of the principles of God and of Jesus to our lives. It's, it's difficult to live a life like Jesus, isn't it? It's hard for us in this day and age to be like Jesus. So I think we're like the disciples. We struggle with belief. The gospel writer, I love how he's so intentional about how he talks about it in the story. Here we have a miracle that happens, the transfiguration, right? Also the healing of the boy. But that's not where the 
the emphasis or the point of the story is. The miracle is just a mechanism to lead us to the heart of the story. And, and we see in this interaction that happens between the disciples and Jesus afterwards, it's so, so honest, kind of raw and honest. And they're like, come on, Jesus, tell me. Tell me, what, what, what did we do wrong? You know, when we come to Jesus with an honest, humble heart and we ask to know something, He's going to let us know. He's going to tell us. You know, it may be a friend come to you and, and, and speak a word of advice in your ear. It may, be, you know, who, it may be a pastor from a stage, right? It could be anything. It could be youth group. It could be a coworker at work. God uses people to tell us what he wants. And, and I love that this honest, humble approach is here. And Jesus tells them, ye of little faith. You don't have enough faith? And I know that you hear this, and, and people weaponize that all the time. Well, yeah, if you would just pray more, if you had a little bit more faith, if you really believed, right? I've been at the, the bedside of people, who my family members, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I still lost them, right? We've all been there. That's not what I want to hear from you when I'm hurting. Oh, if you'd have just prayed a little bit more, he'd still be with me. I want to punch somebody in the face when they say that. You know what? <laughs> I wouldn't, maybe. Right? But if you just had the faith of a tiny mustard seed, and right, and you've, you all heard that story a billion times, right? The mustard seed, smallest thing, in, on, 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 smallest seed that we have, and it grows into this giant uh, plant, Right? They just had that little bit of faith. They could move mountains. If they could just believe all the things that Jesus had shown them up to this point. They could remove any obstacle in their path. And even Jesus calls them out, ye of little faith. See, mountains do come into our lives, I think. Especially, they usually show up when we least expect it. How many know who Lewis and Clark is? Heard of them? Kind of famous people, right? Yeah. Well, good. Studying. That's good. He's going to start school again. I had to look it up. No, I'm kidding. Lewis and Clark, they led this expedition, right? The president of the United States said, hey, I want to know what's, what's out there. And they decided we're going to go and we're going to explore the territory of the United States. And this is in the 18, 1804. They start this, right? And these guys know what's up. They, this isn't their first thing. They, they, they know that it's going to be very ambitious and an arduous journey. It's going to be a tough thing, right? And they hop in their canoes and they're going to take the rivers. And they figure this river is just going to dump them right out into the ocean. They're paddling along. And pad Can you imagine? I wonder how many times they flipped. Kathy and I, every time we go canoe and I flip it, we haven't been in a canoe in a long time. But um, so here they are, they're canoeing the mountains, right? Well, that's a book I read, sorry. They are canoeing towards this thing, and then all of a sudden, there's these big rocks in the way, giant ones. I think they call them the Rocky Mountains, right? We've been there, some of you have been there, drove over them, and they hit it, right? And they, they're like, what do they do? What are they going to do? And this obstacle pops up in their way. That's like the defining moment of their expedition, and they got to figure out what's up. Now, these mountains will appear in our path, too. And they can surprise us, and they can frustrate us, and they can make us so mad, and they can be overwhelming, and they kind of put us in this state of despair, like, oh, poor me, no way, what am I going to do? When they show up, Jesus tells us we have power over them. Literal, actual mountains, we have power over that. We have power over the obstacles in our lives. Those mountains can be overcome if we just have a little bit of faith. And I, I didn't, in writing this and studying for this, I, that's a hard one to talk about. You know what I mean? Because you, it's like I said it already, people weaponize this, this, just have a little bit of faith. So here's what I want you to know about faith. The disciples didn't completely lack faith. They had faith, right? They saw Jesus. They were there. And when I read this story, I kind of think about, you know, the larger story. In Matthew 16, Peter is one of the disciples who confesses to Jesus for the first time, as far as we know, that, that Jesus is the Christ. That takes a lot of faith to finally go, yep, that guy is from God. <laughs> that guy is the Messiah to really believe it. And I think that demonstrates great faith. So if, if they had faith, and we have faith, right? 
We have faith. You have faith in all kinds of stuff in this world, right? How many times do you guys take a left or a right on the, on the road and not really look? You just go, you assume they're going to stop at that stop sign, right? That's faith. And I know sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> I heard about that story, right? But we, we typically have faith, right, in a lot of stuff. So if we, they had faith and we have faith, what's the deal? So Jesus is telling me here, I think we need to think differently when it comes to faith, to understanding what faith really is. Right? I have faith, right? I have faith that this thing's going to hold me when I sit down on it. That's a type of faith, right? But if, I could say I believe it, but if I don't ever sit on it, I don't really trust it, do I? See, faith is something that reaches deep into the depths of our soul, right? And it directs the steps of my life. Do you see the difference of what I'm trying to say here between belief and faith? You can believe in something. Do you have faith in it? Faith is not just belief. Faith is a combination of belief and trust. So whatever we believe and trust in tends to determine how our lives go. If we believe it and we trust it. We make decisions based on those beliefs. We make decisions about our lives based on how much we, we trust people and trust ourselves and trust other things. We put our faith in some things and, and, and all kinds of things. Sometimes we put our faith in ourselves. Sometimes we put our faith in other people or other gods and idols. You heard that, right? In the Bible, you read about gods and idols. Don't put your faith in, in other gods or these false idols, the golden cow and all this stuff, right? But we've kind of modernized that stuff today, and we put our faith in, in things like money, right? Oh, I left my wallet. I was going to pull out some cash. We put our faith in money. We put our faith in, in fame, even in our, in our notoriety, who we are. Have you ever heard of someone try to get out of the ticket just by saying, do you know who I am? I do that here in CJ every time I get pulled over. It doesn't work. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I know the mayor. No, I'm just kidding. All right? But we put our faith in our notoriety and our fame. Does it ever work? Sometimes we don't put our faith in anything, and that can kind of be, you know, extremely volatile and put us in, in really bad situations. But for me, the question Jesus is asking is, do you trust me? Do you trust Jesus? Do you trust what he says? Do you trust what you've read about him? Do you trust the things in, that you have actually seen in your own life when it comes to Jesus and how you have, have changed? Because if you really are a follower of Christ and, and you, you read the Bible and you study and you pray and you do all these spiritual disciplines and, you know, I know that sounds like Christianese or something like that, but when you really, really try to follow Jesus, you are going to be a different person, guaranteed. Because God has a plan for all of our lives, right? He calls us into something. He's called me to be the pastor of this church today and hopefully for another 20 years, right? Right? He calls you, and he calls you, and he calls you into something more. But do you believe him? Do you trust him? Do you trust all that I have shown you? And if you can do that, just have a little bit of trust, you can move mountains. Literally. And knowing all this, here, here's the best way I can describe faith, and, and even what Jesus is talking about when, when he says some people lack faith. I think faith is, is a forecast. right? We put our faith in forecasts all the time, don't we? I wish the weatherman came here. I could talk to him about forecast, right? But all the time, we, we project sales and meteorologists, the weatherman, they project how the weather's going to be, and, and we take all the information that we have, we study it, and we look at the situations, we run these algorithms, and we look at all possible scenarios and how the outcome is, and, and we go, yep, I think that's probably the best way to go. We put a lot of faith and trust in that, right? How many of you left the house today without an umbrella? We just assume it's a sunny day, right? So we use all of that information to come to a place of trust and understanding. Then we're able to generate the most likely outcome. That's what a forecast is. And Jesus is, tells the disciples, he's telling them to make a forecast based on what they've already seen and who they know God to be. Who do you know God to be? Jesus, from the time he began his ministry right up until this point, has always been about goodness and life and love. He's been about leading people to a place of wholeness and peace. Jesus is working for the good of all creation. Everything. He gave us this planet to manage, right? 
we can debate whether we're doing a good job at that all day long, whatever, I'm not getting into that. But all creation was given to us for goodness. And he is constantly restoring and healing and fixing whatever is broken within us and in our world. If we believe, if we have faith, if we do the next right thing, whatever that right thing is for you. Now, having a mustard seed of faith like I believe we all have. Because you've shown faith, whether it's in God or in your wallet. You have faith, right? But is our faith in the right place? And does that mean that, that if we have this mustard seed of faith in God, does that mean that we're not going to have a bad day or bad weeks or bad months or bad years? No, we're going to have these things. And we may have mental breakdowns and things that we just freak out about and we can't handle it no more. And, and, and we have these periods in life where we're just simply trying to survive, to get by, paycheck to paycheck, just living. God, God give me one more day. And if something really, really bad happens to you or, or a loved one or in this world, it's not because you lack faith. Faith gives us a, a, a long-term outlook on life, based on who God is. We can have faith because, of, because we trust God, and God is faithful. I'm reminded of a, of a story once I heard. Uh, there was a lady in the hospital, and she wasn't doing well. She, she was probably going to die. And she said, I believe, I trust God is going to heal me. And I was like, wow. He's either going to heal me here, or he's going to heal me there. Either way, I'm going to be healed. That's the kind of trust and faith we're talking about. Yeah, maybe, maybe there is a miracle, and sometimes they, they come home from the hospital. Sometimes, you know, we, we survive the wreck, or sometimes this, you know, we make it, but sometimes we don't. But if we are a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ, at the very next moment after death, we realize death didn't win. There's Jesus right there. If you're a follower and a believer and a lover of Jesus, <laughs> The next thing you see is Jesus standing there saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. I imagine that day every day, thinking about that. Not that I want to be there yet. I'm not saying I'm suicidal. But what I'm saying is I, I want to feel that hug, that love, when Jesus grabs me and says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I'm looking forward to. That's what my goal is in life. And that's what my goal is here is that you all have that type of faith. And know that we're going to come up against mountains and we're going to come up against roadblocks, but we're either going to go around them, we're going to go over them, we're going to go through them, whatever it takes. It's not about how it ends. In Philippians 4.13, it says this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. With just a little bit of faith, we can move mountains. With just a little bit of faith, all things are possible. I think about this church, burnt to the ground, nothing happening here, oh my gosh. Now look. We're a growing, thriving church, healthy, full of people who love God and want to serve God. There's a man, Walter Bergman, he describes wisdom this way. He says, wisdom is a force that is creative and willing creation to its true fulfillment. Being wise is bringing one's life, conduct, and policy into coherence with the generative resolve of shalom. That's hard to even read, but what is he saying there, right? He's saying that wisdom, knowledge applied, is the undercurrent of our faith. It's moving and creating and leading us to a place of shalom. What is shalom? Wholeness and peace. Wholeness and peace. There's this man, I have a hard time saying his name, Dashroth Manji. And he lived in a rural village in, in, way out in, in India, right? And his job, they had to climb a mountain up and over the mountain, do his job, then get it done, get paid, come back over the mountain, because that's where the city was, their village is over here. He did that year after year after year. And that mountain wasn't an easy climb. It took him a couple hours to get over the mountain every day. Can you imagine that? that? That story, I walked to school uphill both ways. He really did, right? And he did it over and over and over. Well, one day, his wife gets sick, and she's too sick to make it over the mountain. And unfortunately, she passes away. He's mad. He decides, I'm going to do something about this. And he starts to, to, with hand tools. He decides that instead of going over that mountain, I'm going to go through it. And with hand tools, he starts tacking away and beating on this thing. And he did this for 22 years until the, the project was completed. Here's a picture of him right now. 
He kind of, how big was it? It was 25 feet high, 30 feet wide, and 360 feet long with hand tools. He didn't, in this village, they didn't have power tools. They weren't like backhoes and stuff out there. Can you imagine, like a, a hammer and a chisel. 22 years he dug a path through there. Now his village has a streamlined, safe access to the next town that actually has services that, that, that other people may be saved. Because of his act of faith, this community is better. So he didn't give up. The kind of faith Jesus wants us to have is to believe the impossible can actually happen. To believe that the best is yet to come. That just a grain of salt and maybe some hand tools can get you through another day. And for today, that's the good news. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May you all continue to lead people to Jesus. May you all continue to love like Jesus. That's part of faith. We are called to be disciples, to love like Jesus. Father, I just pray and I ask that you would just bless this congregation. Help us to, to see the ways today that, that we can lean into you. Whatever, the, whatever those obstacles are that, are that are that are blocking us or separating us from a true relationship with you, God, help us to see them, to recognize them, and know and understand that you will walk us through them. Lord, we pray and we ask this all in your son's most holy name. Amen.